Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, <laughs> I ladies. I think what I'd like to do is start with general information so you can give us your name, your date of birth, where you were born. I'm Milt Kennan, Milton Kennan. I was born in Philadelphia on Friday, June the 2nd, 1933, in the Kensington section of Philadelphia. My parents' names were Mary Smith Kennan, and my father was Milton Benjamin Kennan. Okay, any siblings? I have a sister, Janet, who was born in 1938 and still living. And um, I know that over the years you've told me stories about the significance and the influence that your mother had in your life. So can you tell me a little bit about your mom and dad? Oh, and gosh, yes, right? my mom. Yeah, she was, in the, she was a trip. <laughs> I mean, I think I got a lot of my so-called humor from my mother because she called it like it was. And she, my father didn't get away with anything either. They were on the same page even supposedly with my with the kids' homeworks, you know. They read all the report cards, all the homework that we were given. My elementary school was the Isaac A. Shepherd Public School at Cambria and on Cambria Street in Philadelphia. And then I went to my senior years were at the John B. Stetson Junior High on B in Allegheny and then my senior years was at Northeast Public High School. At that time, it was at 8th and Lehigh Avenues in Philadelphia. How about special teachers? Oh, ah, my <laughs> teachers. My teachers. I had, I had several, but the two that are very dear to me to this day are two of my history teachers. It was Harry Krug and Benjamin Seltzer. Sel Selzer was his name. They imparted history that, that it meant something. It wasn't just words. I mean, they, they actually lived it too. I mean, they, the way they imparted it. I remember we had a, I don't know about you, you, you ladies, but we had a little weekly newspaper, which we would buy. It was like a dollar a month, I think, for, for, 12, for four weeks. And I look forward to that. It was the local, it was the now news, where in school you, you learned about Columbus and everything. And this, this kept you up to date. I wish I still had copies of those little newspapers. But, and I, some years later, when we were at an alumni association dinner, my two, those two teachers were still living. And I went up to the dais and said to the, burn, the host that was doing it, I said, I would like to give honors to two of my teachers and they said and they he asked who it was and the host had those teachers too and i i honored them and everybody the whole room applauded got up and applauded so in 1957 i know this is something you wanted to do it's a place you wanted to work correct the next year yeah next. i had <clears throat> i had my eye on the historical society of pennsylvania and uh that was 10 happy years, 10 happy years. And Mr. Nicholas Wainwright, who was the director, was a wonderful person. He wrote a book on lithography, which I thought we, we might have it here. And I, I think I helped him with the book. And that, that was good because you got to know the collections and, you know, look up and then these old views of in Philadelphia. And that's... Oh, gosh, you'll love this. I just thought of it. One day, I was downstairs doing something on the first floor, I think in an exhibit, and this man came in the door. He was drunk. And I looked at him, and I said, Ah, oh, I know that face. It was John Barrymore, Jr. He was drunk as a, a day is long. He had a box under his arm. It was his dad. His father wanted to be buried in Philadelphia with his grandmother, Mrs. Drew, who owned a theater down on Arch Street. He didn't want to be buried out in, in Hollywood. He was buried in Hollywood, and he wanted to be reinterred here in Mount Peace Cemetery in Philadelphia. And he said, 
yeah, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm here to bury my father. And, and I said, uh, Mr. Barrymore, you can't bury him here. You got to go to the cemetery. Well, where the hell was the cemetery? And I, the cab was still outside. So I took him back outside and I said, this man wants to go to Mount Peace Cemetery. Do you know where it is? He says, yeah. And off he went to the cemetery. Well, the upshot was, I, I found out later, he got his father buried and he stuck the cemetery with the bill. He didn't pay, he never paid the bill for the interment. That was my John Barrymore Jr. story. <laughs> okay, well, I know you have another story from that time when you got a phone call from Ron Fields. Yeah, I got a roll, call from Ron Fields who is, I guess, still living, I guess, I don't know, I haven't seen him in years, is the grandson of W.C. Fields, the comedian, world known. Well, it took me back for a moment because I didn't. I said, "How did Mr. Fields? How did you, how did you track me down, or, or why?" You know, he said, "Well, you wrote, you had an article in the in the uh, in the Philadelphia Bulletin, uh, written by Jim Smart. I think he, the column was called Our Town, and he would write human interest story, like today's Lester Truck thing. And I wrote this story about W. C. Fields." And he saw it, or somebody sent it to him. And that whole that story led me to know the Fields family. Bill F Ron Fields this, came to Philadelphia. We did a field trip of all the sites that were associated with his grandfather in the theater days, and all of that. And we became good friends. And uh, I met Ron, uh, Bill, who was his brother who was at that time he was worked for the FBI and Ron was actually like the head of the family uh, preserving the family heritage and taking you know that people didn't abuse the name or take it um, you know so um, he said oh would you like to meet my father Claude Fields that was the father the son of WC Fields he says Oh, well, sure, you know, why not? So he's, I said, is he here in town? He says, no, he's in Hollywood. Well, it happened to be that I was going to how, I was going to California in about six months. So he called up his father and he said, oh, I, you got to meet this guy, Milt Kennan, you know? I'm, yeah. So, uh, so eventually I went out to California and uh, met Mr. Fields. You thought you were looking at W.C. Fields. I mean, it was like the image of his father. He went, William Fields, the, the entertainer, was William Claude Fields, but he was born Claude William Fields, but he never used Claude. So the son didn't use William, he used Claude. So he said to me one day, he said, I was out there, he says, well, what are you doing tomorrow night? Or would you like to go to a party? Okay, I'm all up for a party, you know. So he said, I said, where? He said, I'm not going to tell you. Mr. Fields was lawyer for the stars, the celebrities, and other people, but the less celebrities. So off we go. We go to Beverly Hills. I said, uh-oh, this is big time, you know. You knew right away, Beverly Hills. So get out of the car, go up the drive. He knocks on the, rings the doorbell. And this woman comes to the door. <laughs> she, she's got an apron on and a spatula in her hand. I froze. I froze. It was Barbara Stanwyck. <laughs> what the public did? He, she says, hi, hi, Claude, come on in. Who's your friend? Before he could answer, she's, a, she's on the back of the house making the hamburgers. <laughs> she says, I'm going to have a few friends over lately. Yeah. Hmm. So... There was a whole litany of celebrities that came to the party. Maureen O'Hara, Bruce Cabot, Randolph Scott. Was I out of my league? I mean, I didn't know these people. What do you talk about? The movies? What, what could I talk about? What an event that was. Barbara Stanwyck standing with a pass in her hand, hamburgers of all people. She had a maid, but she did the work. So while you were there, I know you did one other thing. Yeah. So I'm... I'm in Santa Monica. So I went into the, all of a sudden I thought of, of uh, Laurel Hardy. I don't know what 
because I was in a Laurel Hardy tent club in Philadelphia, two tars tent. So I wanted to find out. I said, they had phone books in those days, you know. <laughs> so I looked at, and Stan Laurel was listed in the phone book. I said, okay. So I go into the phone booth, and I dial the number. This man picks up the phone. Hello, this is Stan. Ah, <laughs> this is Stan. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm a fan. You know, I said, I enjoyed your films with, with Oliver Hardy. He said, uh, what are you doing today? I said, well, I'm on the phone talking to you, and then I'm going back to Philadelphia tomorrow, the next day or something. He says, you free for lunch? Yeah. So I said, how far are you? I said, I'm in Santa Monica. He said, well, I'll give you the address and hop in the cab and come on over. I went in the cab. So I got to this apartment house, and they let me in, and he was on the third floor overlooking the ocean in Santa Monica. He had a lunch on the terrace. I was in this apartment with Stan Laurel, and this whole apartment was just loaded with pictures of his days with Stan Laurel and other celebrities. Unforgettable. Unforgettable. So now I know you started out at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania working in the library, and then you moved to the manuscript department for five years. I was in the reading room or the library, and then I went to the manuscripts department. Okay, and there was one thing that stands out from that manuscript. Well, I always had a, I always had an interest because of those two history teachers that really led me down the history path to get further into the world of history beyond the, the printed word. I always sort of thought, you know, I wanted to learn more about, you know, the written word, the original written word. So one day I was called in to sub for someone in the manuscript department. And so I walk into the, that was around the corner and down the hall and into the next room. And uh, the first person that came, that gave me a, a slip for a request was somebody who wanted uh, some Madison, James Madison letters. Ooh. So I went back into the vault and pulled out the Madison folder and I opened the folder before I went back into the room to give them and I had to open the folder and I, I, I picked up this letter. That was the first letter that I ever had in my hand in a manuscript form was a James Madison letter when he was president, a presidential letter. I was hooked for the rest of my career. <laughs> okay, so now we have Historical Society of Pennsylvania, 1957 to 1967. You left there and went to the Presbyterian Historical Society. I know that during that time, at that particular job, you attended a seminar in Washington, D.C. Oh, uh, yeah, I went down. I was asked to go to Washington to take an archival course and at the National Archives in Washington. So we went into this room on the, on the second floor. It was a two weeks course, and interesting beyond belief. So we went into this room, and as most people do, if you have a, a session that lasts more than a day, you go back to the same seat that you had the day before, which I did. So I my back was to the door, the, the door to the room, and there was a little stand there with a telephone. And Mr. the archivist said, if the f phone rings, pick it up because it might be the White House. And that was a fantastic week. I mean, uh, the memories of that, the imparting of the information about, and we, we went we went out down to the archives and saw the, con the Declaration of Independence and all that stuff and all these things. And the phone rang a couple of times and it, it was the White House calling and um, he had to leave, and then somebody took over. And, and there was, I think, the third or fourth time the phone rang. I picked it up, and he said, this is Lyndon. Uh, well, you know. So I said, uh, yeah, Mr. President, uh, the archivist is here. He'll be <laughs> right over. <laughs> he said, And he said, thank you. 
<laughs> my one second to fame with the president, not a five minutes or anything, but one one second to fame. <laughs> I can't even forget things like that, you know? Uh, Lyndon. Oh, geez. Okay, so now we're moving on. Yeah. You're gone to work, 1972. Oh. You're at Stanford University oh, in Palo Alto, California. Yes. Yeah, and you're working in the... Hoover, Hoover Library of War, Revolution, and Peace, which is at Stanford University. And Again, as an archivist. And all, I was hired as an archivist, assistant ar an archivist, an archivist. They were, there were others. Right. And we, they had the head archivist, and I was just a junior archivist, I guess. All right, now I know that... You were given some instruction when you first started there. Oh yeah, that was that was paramount. You you did it or what you didn't, and that was the end of you. You were never you 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 knew you sort of knew ahead of time that you were going to meet celebrities and students that were doing research at the library, but c celebrities that would come would possibly come in to do research. And the first thing that was said to us was that if you ever asked for an autograph from any celebrities, there was no ifs, ands, or buts. You were out the door. You were fired. Automatically, you, fi you got fired. You, that was etched in your brain right away. So did you meet celebrities? Well, I, yes. Uh, the first celebrity that I can remember was Shirley Temple Black who lived in Woodside, which was down the road from Palo Alto. And she was um, just been appointed by President Reagan as to amb ambassador to Luxembourg. So she came in to do research and I was appointed to be, to take care of her. It would, and she was out there for two days, I think, two or three days. So I, I took care of giving her what she wanted. and. We we just chatted a little bit, but no autographs, or else. <laughs> so I said, the "Little the little princess was there, you know." <laughs> I almost forgot to tell you this. My buddy that worked there, we he said, "I want you to meet somebody." The man was on a fellowship at Stanford. I think he lived in New York at the time. I don't know if he ever became a citizen or not. He said, I said, Ron, who is this? He said, oh, no, we'll go downstairs and out. In the, he's sitting out. I know he's sitting out there in the, in, the, in the park. Okay, he came back. So we went down. This little old man, I don't know how, I, he was probably 80 years old or something at the time. I don't know. A little bit. So Ron says, Milt, I'd like you to meet Alexander Kerensky. Ah! Alexander Kerensky, the first president of Russia after the revolution. He was a revolutionary. And I'm talking to this man, this little old man. He says, how do you do? No, <laughs> you know, you know. So I sat and talked to him for about five, six minutes or something about the, oh, he, lo he wanted to talk about the revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, you know. How do you, can you beat that? Uh, <laughs> I came up the stairs one day and there was somebody playing the piano. And he was, at, as it turned out, he was doing a, a, a entertaining at a dinner, a dinner that night at the Union League, and he was playing the piano. And I, I looked in to the room, and he must have heard me. And he turned around. And he says, "Hello." And I said, "Oh." And I looked at him. It's Victor Borga, the the pianist. So he says, oh, "Come on in." Oh, sit down on the bench with me. He pushes, he, he leans over so I can sit on the bench. I said, Mr. Borga, I can't play the piano. Oh, come on, just tinkle the T's. And I'm going, I'm going like this. And I, I said, I, I don't want to ruin your, your, your entertainment. He says, well, we're just in rehearsal right now, you know. I'm just playing a bit. And I, I never saw him again, but it was just one of those passing things, you know. Nice, nice gentleman, you know. And during this time, you were invited to the White House. Oh yeah, that was uh, Eisenhower. Oh, that's way back. That was Eisenhower. So that was way before that. Yeah, I guess. Well, tell that story. Eisenhower. Uh, he was president. Eisenhower, and it was the retirement. I was invited to the 
a retirement dinner of John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State. Oh, geez. And I'm in the state dining room with all these politicians and whatnot. So we just go through the line, and I met John Forster Dulles and the, all the cabinet members, I guess, at the time, and who knows what, and, and there's Mr. Eisen, Mr. Eisen, President Eisenhower, and Mamie. How did you get invited there? A friend of mine worked somewhere in some capacity in the White House, and he, for some reason he thought of me, called me on the phone and said, can you come down to the White House tomorrow night or something? And woo, down I went, you know. <laughs> okay, now the Gerald Ford story, is that Union League? or is Yeah, that that's the Union League. League. Okay. So I was a librarian, and he was to give a talk, a luncheon, a day. This was about 1975. He was president now of like two years or a year and a half or something. And... Uh, uh, I said a couple of days, the FBI did a check on everybody, looked up, and, uh, you know, they checked me out. And I said, gee, you think I could meet the president if he comes? And he said, well, I'll see if, what, what I can do. They couldn't promise anything like that. So uh, I was hoping. So I stood at the, the day he came in, I was standing at the door of the library, and he was, he he came out, the, opened the elevator and came out the elevator. It was a little down the hall. So instead of co going to the dining room, he came my way. So apparently it worked. The FBI said, the librarian wants to meet you or something. So he, so he came out. I'm standing at the front of the library doors, you know, shake his hand like that. He, a good handshake, you know. And I shook his hand like a real shake, shake hand. And he says, how do you do? Uh, what's your name? And I said, you know. And I said, he says, what do you do here? Ch idle shit chat stuff. And I said, I'm a librarian. I said, and then I, all of a sudden I said, do you know, you know something about the Civil War, Mr. President? He said, oh, that's one of my favorite projects. I said, have you ever been to Gettysburg? Oh, yeah, you want to talk about, hey, let's, sit, let, let's go here, sit down, and we'll talk about the Civil War. <laughs> 15 minutes of fame with the President of the United States talking about the Civil War. <laughs> and he said, after that, he said, well, I, you know, I got to go to this luncheon. He said, I, I, I'd hope I can get back, but he, his schedule didn't permit, so off he went. But I had 15 minutes with the President of the United States. And I was just so, I, I, you know, I was so relaxed. I, just like here, like I'm sitting here. And he's he was so down to earth. It made he made you feel so comfortable that you didn't know he was the president of the United States. We were talking about something that we were both interested in, and that's what made the fifteen minutes just fly by. So you leave there now. Where am I at now? <laughs> now you're headed to Arizona, oh, Phoenix, but, Arizona. So had you worked on Rendell's I worked on campaign? Rend I worked on. I worked on a Rizzo camp, Frank Rizzo campaign, and two Ed Rendell campaigns. And I worked, I did, I worked on Nevada Tano's campaign too. And they were both together at that point in the, in the dining room, they were going around saying hello to everybody. And she recognized me. And Ed Rendell was standing next. And Janet Napolitano says, oh, here's one of my former workers on my campaign. And he said, I know you. <laughs> he remembered me. He said, oh, Janet, he worked for me too. Well, we both get credit. <laughs> and then you worked on another campaign. <laughs> How about that? What was that one? In Arizona. Oh, yeah. I worked for this guy. Jeez, I can't remember his name. He was uh, running against somebody by the name of John McCain. Well, you know what happened. We, we, put up, we put a good campaign through, you know. We, we thought we did a good job. And he lost, of course, this man. And John won, of course. So this man said, well, I'm going to give you a farewell luncheon. So... To the campaign work, to the people... The campaign who workers, campaign. you know. So he said, we're going up to Flagstaff to this restaurant in Flagstaff. We were in Phoenix at the time. 
we all with the Flagstaff. I don't know what some association he had with Flagstaff. I don't know what it was. So I don't know how this happened, but it did. We walk in the restaurant, and our friend, the, the former candidate for office, was going to order for us, or we were going to say what we wanted. The door opens, and John McCain comes into the restaurant. Stop. I'm buying for everybody. Now, he's buying for the losers. He didn't have to do that. Very, very nice guy. So, as it turned out, we all sat at the table. John sat across from me. He said something like, how do you like the hamburgers? He, I said, oh, this, you know, Senator, I, it's, they're very good. He said, well, I come here quite often because he didn't live that far away. Uh, no, he lived, no, he lived in Cottonwood. I, I don't know. Where's Cottonwood? To, is that Oh, is that Sedona? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we were in Flagstaff. So um, he said, yeah, I lived in Cottonwood. So we had, we talked a little bit about Washington and all that. <laughs> John McCain gives me a hamburger. <laughs> So let's talk about your time with the Historical Society here in Doylestown. Uh, you returned to Pennsylvania, as Sherry said, in 2009. How did you find us? How did you come to this? Well, place? first I came, I lived with my niece. She lived at that time in Buckingham and uh, <clears throat> for some time. And then I, and then eventually she moved to New Hope, which I didn't want to to go to New Hope to live. I thought I wanted to get into a, a more um, work environment area, you know, that there was more activities than, I. well, New Hope might have been okay, but anyway. So um, I came into this town here and I went to the Mercer Museum. And I said, do you need any, you need any help in the library? So they called up and they didn't need anybody. Okay. All right, yeah, so, and, yeah, and I, and I, and I said, and they, I said, is there any other <clears throat> libraries or historical societies? And she said, yeah, there's one over on um, South Main Street, the Doylestown Historical Society. So I marched myself over here, and the first person I saw was Fletcher Walls, who is still here today. Their administrator. An administrator. He's the administrator for the society at the present time. So he said he could not make the decision to hire me if he wanted to, but he had that would have been the president, which his name was Ed Ludwig, who was the president and a, and a, a judge of the courts. So I had an interview with, with Ludwig, Judge Ludwig, and uh, here I am. So the Bucks County Historical Society's loss was the Doylestown Historical Society's gain. So you've been here, as Stu originally said, a, a whole decade. What were some of the first things you did when you joined us? Well, I was presented with this room, which was not as you see it now. It was decorated uh, two years after I came. It was less the room that it is now. But one of the, I believe really the first thing that I got interested in was, and this is funny because school didn't mean that awfully. I mean, I had a school career. And it was okay and I, was, I wasn't going to become a, a school teacher or anything like that. But the first one, I think the first thing I became is to build up their school, uh, local school collection. So they had a school here called the Doylestown High School, which was here from 19, 1892 to 1951, and it since burned down. And we had some records of it here, which is over to my left. And I proceeded to, over the years, to build up the collections to get we have an entire collection of all their yearbooks from uh, the yearbook started in uh, 1918 and 
lasted until the school closed in 51. And then I also gathered additional information, clippings and ephemera information, and we have that on file for each class. That is each class of the high school. I built that up. And then we, I also built up the collection of the Central Bucks West High School uh, from 1952 to the present time, 2019. And we have all those yearbooks and also a file for every class for anything that events that happened in the history of that particular class, we would have it on file. As much as people contribute the material to us, we have it. So, and we have all the yearbooks of that school too, up to the present time. And as we sit here in the library and, and your desk is over to your right, behind your desk is a whole bank of filing cabinets. That's something else you established, correct? Well, I, I I believe that uh, uh, to a degree, a, uh, a lot of it was here. Th that was something that was also here. I just, again, built that up. What we have here is uh, uh, over 2,000 files on real estate, mainly the Darrellstown Borough, of every, just about every street is represented in our files here which is like 2,000 folders, give and take. And every house number. And just about every house number. And uh, the, it's constantly in use. People come in here. We have a house researcher that uses it, Kurt Spence, who uses it to do house histories upon request. If someone comes in and wants their house research, he will do it. And they're wonderful research tools for and we have a one, each one that he does on file here and uh, we also have uh, collections of businesses it's about 15 drawers of businesses in alphabetical order mainly Doylestown and or there's some in the outlining districts but mostly Doylestown businesses that no longer exist buildings that uh, have since opened up since I've been here, some have closed and we try to keep the records going. If a business closes, I usually put on the file, closed uh, April 1951, uh, 18, whatever the month is, and well, something that opens, I put the clippings in there and say opened October 19, 2019 or something like that. And we also have numerous collections down in the archives of various families, businesses that you have compiled over the years. Oh yeah, we we have we have major collections. I would say we have uh, seventy-five collections down there of of varying sizes. Some one box, some eighteen boxes. There's a a collection of genealogical materials. Uh, the, which is our largest collection, which is uh, 25 boxes. Yeah. It's not very used much, but it's there if one wants to use it. So in addition to all your archival duties, what would you say you're most proud of having accomplished, perhaps in the research line here at the Society? I'm thinking well, specifically of some of the programs uh, that we've put uh, together. Uh, one of my things that I enjoyed doing and hopefully maybe I will maybe continue to doing in my next journey is if an event is uh well we have we have several events namely what the uh, Maplewood? Maplewood which is a community to the east of here it's a community of 186 houses part of Doylestown once which was once a start of uh Plumstead and maybe Buckingham, I'm not sure, but now it's merged into Dawestown Borough. And uh, the houses are wonderful little houses of all individual. They're not a Levittown type. They're all, they're all individuals, and they were built between 1946 and 1965, and it was started by, uh, it was built for the veterans of coming back from World War II to give them a kickstart on what they wanted to do. 
and a, at that time, inexpensive place to, ha to have their families. In 2016, we celebrated their 70th anniversary of the building of Maplewood. And uh, one of the fondest memories I've had of that was to get as many descendants and a lot of the families of the builders to come back and join us. We had, that day was a beautiful Saturday out at Maplewood in the park there. And we had uh, oh, about 300 people. Hmm. And so, you, you brought back uh, people uh, who were associated with the various street names. Yes, we. every family out there was represented except one of every, a relative that was descendant of the, how the street got its name. The soldiers, all the soldiers' names were, that's who, uh, uh, Maplewood is, the streets are represented by the name of a soldier who was killed in the Second World War. And that all, everybody who was descendant was a, a brother, uh, a sister, or a son, or a daughter. Absolutely a wonderful day. Now you also did research for our World War I commemoration. Oh yeah, the Memorial Fountain, which is a fountain that's up at the corner of Main and Broad Street, and it was erected in 1922, and it was uh, for, um, in memory of the soldiers in, from Doylestown, mainly, I guess, from World War I, and we had the, the daughter of the sculptor of the fountain. She lived in New Hampshire, and she brought her daughter. She was bursting with pride. She said, who got me here? And they pointed over to me. Oh, and she came over and she hugged me. <laughs> and that I had honored her. They had never been honored before. This was the first time in all the years since the fountain was put in that she had ever, her father had ever been honored for this. And you also found family members of the models who posed for the sculpture. Yeah, the models that were posed for the monument, uh, which was a Mr. Russell Gulick, who was one soldier, and the other was a Raymond Rutherford, who was the other soldier. And I can't remember which was which. One was, one was giving water to the other one. And uh, their, their family was here. And a third example of your research was revealed at the Doylestown Centennial Talk at the Doylestown Bookshop. Yes, that was in uh, March of 2018. That was History Month at the bookstore. And we had the Centennial of Doylestown was in 1938, uh, anniversary of that, 2018. We had, we had descendants of the different people that were involved in the committees at that event. And no, not not the well. The the queen was Caroline Fellman, mm -hmm. whose two sons oh, were yeah. here. We'd run around in there One came from Georgia. Like he wanted to thing. come up to hear this, and, uh, and the other one was Miss Shaw, runner up for the queen. And Caroline Fellman has deceased, you, no. but Miss Shaw, she still is alive when I call, when I call, and she lived in upstate New York. And she spoke with you on the phone. She spoke to me on the phone. And I told her on Thursday, I said, we're going to have this event on Saturday. I said, would you like to have, uh, to get, I uh, would get you on the phone on Saturday when the audience at the bookstore was here. We'd like to say hello to you. Now, what I'd like you to do is when I get her on the phone, I'm going to hold up my cell phone like that. And would you all say, uh, Greetings from Doylestown, Miss Columbia. That's what I like you to say. Okay, let's see if we can get her on the phone. Is this Mrs. Shelley? All right. I have a few people here that would like to say something to you, Mrs. Shelley. Okay. Go ahead. Greetings from Doylestown, Miss Columbia. She said hello. I said to the audience. Say hello from Doylestown, and they all said hello to Doylestown, and she broke up. She was emotional, and I was breaking up 
standing there doing this, but that's the things that I love to do. You know, to get living descendants of an event, and that was 80 years ago, and here this woman is still alive, and in the audience was a lady that was in that class of 1938. And she knew these, these gals. She was not in the parade, she was an onlooker. And she was a neighbor of mine in the building that I used to live. That was priceless. I loved that. To talk to this lady, she said, oh, hello, Doylestown, you know. <laughs> Your knowledge about Doylestown is just incredible. And considering that you're a relative newcomer, 10 years in the town, and your memory, your memory of the detail of the town is also incredible. What's your secret? I don't think it's a secret. I think it's just acquiring the knowledge of the place you're at and, and just absorbing it and being interested in it. Some people don't even know their neighbors. I have to know everything. If I lived in like Maplewood, I'd have to know everybody in the 280, 186 houses. I'd have to know everybody. I walk down the street and I say hello to this people and they say, oh, I know you. I, I'm not, a, I will not, I'll be the world's worst introvert. <laughs> Extrovert, whoa, you know. <laughs> so and I have a great, I, I've worked with a lot of wonderful people here at the Doylestown Historical Society. And two are sitting right here with me for that. So, well, Shari Halderson and Jean Rollo. So, you will be missed. Yeah. So, uh, so is there anything else that you would like to share with us? I'll think about something tomorrow and I'll bring you all back. Okay. But I can't, I just, uh, Can I get that was that. Well, I, I should also remind you about the, the large plaque on the Millennial Wall that you unearthed at Central Bucks West High School. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I was over at the high, Central Bucks West High School any, any number of years ago now, and the, 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 the principal, Mr. Kevin Munley, said when I was over there, I think I was over there to get yearbooks, copies of yearbooks for, to add to our Central Bucks West High School yearbook collection, and he said, oh, Milt, may, you might be interested in this thing. Uh, so he took me out to the, fr the loading dock, and there on the floor was this it was the cornerstone of the original Doylestown High School building. And we have photographs of it when it was in place facing the Broad Street entrance of the high school. The problem was, and we, we eventually, through Judge Ludwig, who was the spearhead at that time, we got it erected back on the Millennium Wall at the, the at the site of the high school. So I guess I was a contributing factor for that. And I have one thing that I just popped into my head that I think you'd want to mention before we close, and that's the um, Calvert exhibit and how that came about. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, you know, it takes a couple of people to jog your memory. Well... I came across some articles on this artist. Uh, I've never heard of him, but Walter Calvert, who was a, 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 an artist who lived from 1901 to 1916 or so. And um, I said, gee, you know, if his, a lot of his works are around, maybe we could have an exhibit or something on this because we, I don't think we've ever had an exhibit on an artist, a local artist. So I did a little more digging, and in the yearbook, in the Doylestown High School yearbooks, and I was flipping through, and I came across the yearbook for 1956. And in the book was a picture of Mr. Calvert's daughter pointing up on the wall of her father, a father's picture of the high school that he did some years before. And I said, oh, here I go again. I wonder if she's still around. <laughs> Another connection. So I did my digging, and lo and behold, she's living in New Hope, New Hope area. 
And I called her, I called on the phone and I said, we might like to have an exhibit of your father's works. I said, do you have anything of your father's works? Well, that was an understatement. <laughs> Off we go. And she was a most hospitable person. And my God, she had laid out on her furniture all these sketches and pictures of her father. Whoa. He was an illustrator for Saturday Evening Post. I said, w was any of your father's works ever exhibited? She said, no. We're first. She was ecstatic that she, we were going to honor her father. She couldn't be more happy than anybody I've ever seen before. Yeah. She was almost in tears. Yep. Yep. And she came and she was held court every Saturday in June. Right. Came here and was stayed to the, the beginning and the end. And God, the people came in and knew her mm -hmm. and her husband. And it was just a marvelous month of June, all because I had this kernel of interest in some pictures I saw about maybe we would do an exhibit on this artist. Mm -hmm. And it led to that. Okay, now you told me that there was something written in your high school yearbook. My yearbook, under my name, as many people put a caption under their their pictures, it says historian. It was historian that hit me. And I said, I have to live up to that, I guess.